22 for our Bible study hour. Luke chapter 22, and we're going to pick it up in verse 1, and I'll read down through verse 20, and then we'll have a, a short word of prayer. The Bible says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper, furn upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found, as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not eat any more, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you'd bless our Bible study this morning, that you'd speak to our hearts in a very real and personal way. We're thankful again, Lord, for your, as always, your goodness to us, and Lord, for your mercy and for your grace. And we just ask, Lord, that you'd bless this time, draw each of us closer to you. Bless the Sunday school classes downstairs. Lord, we pray that you would just uh, meet with the Sunday school students and be with the teachers as they teach their lessons. Just guide and direct them, Lord, today. Bless the service to follow. Let it all bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to draw your attention to verse 17. And in verse 17, the Bible says, And he took the cup and gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. So, and, and then, as I read, if you had noticed, verses um, 19 and verse 20, uh, they took the bread, and then again in verse 20, they, they also took the cup. So the question I have for you is this, in verse 17, what, what cup did they take in verse 17? Because it's not the same cup as the, what we would call the Lord's Supper or the communion cup. What cup is that? Anybody have any idea what that might be? Because it was part, so what, so as you've read through this, what, what of, make sure you're all engaged with, with me this morning, and what, what's taking place? What, what event is taking place? Yes. It's the Passover. They're meeting to take, to, to celebrate the Passover. And, um, and we're going to see as, as, as we look at this, uh, the whole idea of the Passover and what was taking place here, I think it's really interesting. Um, but I wonder how many, now probably most of you, maybe all of you, you know what the Passover is all about, right? 
or you know what it is. So somebody help me out here. Tell me, what when we talk about the Passover, uh, what are we talking about? Maybe we can have a couple of people interject here. So what is the Passover? Vlad. The commemoration of the Israelites um, being spared when everyone was killed. They got put on the doorpost. All right, good. That's exactly right. I'm going to give everybody some chance to answer, but you're right. You got us started. So it's, it's the deliverance. It's a reminder of the deliverance of the Israelites uh, who were in bondage in Egypt for how long? Anybody know how long they were in bondage? I mean, this could be long, but I think 400 years. Yeah, about 400 years in bondage. And um, then uh, there were plagues. How many plagues were there? But prior to, their, prior to the, the last plague, which is what Vlad was referencing, uh, which was the blood over the doorpost. And anybody know how many plagues altogether? Ten. ten plagues. That's correct. And uh, with regards to the ten plagues that, uh, that were brought then upon the, the Egyptians, uh, what was the significance um, regarding the ten plagues. There was a purpose. It wasn't just the plagues. You know, if you remember, Moses said, uh, was sent by God, and Moses said on numerous occasions to Pharaoh, let my, God said, let my people go, right? So you have, so you have these plagues. First, the first plague that was uh, brought upon them, well, who can tell me? What was the first plague that, that was brought? Go ahead, Bill. All right, they turned the water into blood. And um, then the next plague, anybody know? You probably won't get these in order, but anybody know what some of the other plagues were? There was locusts. So we got the water turned. The, there's locusts, the, the blood. There was the frogs. Uh, there was the what? Couldn't, I couldn't hear. Somebody, go ahead. Like lice, flies, yeah, I think we got five of them. Mulrain. Yeah, you got the rain, right? Darkness. Six. Darkness, right? Seven. Huh? Eight. Boils. Boils, yeah, nine. And then, of course, the final plague was uh, they were to kill the... Uh, each family was to take a lamb. They were to take the lamb, kill the lamb, and put the lamb, the blood of the lamb, over the doorpost. And um, of course, the, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, right? So you have those plagues, and finally, after the last plague, Pharaoh said, you can go. And, um, but there's still some more significance to the 10 plagues that you don't want to miss. Yes? Yes, each plague was uh, a reference to, e e there's a God for each of those plagues. And um, I, don't, I don't want to get into all that. I had a whole list of them, but we got other things to cover this morning. So when the river was turned to blood, it was really to say, no, the God of Moses is the one true living God, the God that you're worshiping, the God, and, and the same with the frogs and, and right on through. Now, interesting, what, what about the last, who was the god for the last plague with regards to the Egyptians? The last plague, when the lamb was to be killed and the blood put over the doorpost. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. They did not sacrifice their children, although elsewhere in the Bible, that was a pagan, there were pagans that did that. No, that's a good guess, though. The yes. The question was, we talked about the first nine plagues, and each of the first nine plagues represented one of the Egyptian gods. The gods, the Egyptians worshipped a multitude of gods, and which was very common, really, for those days. 
Uh, many of the pagans had all kinds of gods, even in the days of the Romans. During the days of Jesus, they worshipped, um, the, the, the Romans worshipped all kinds of gods. But Dan Daniel answered the question already. So, but, but my question, Frank, was what about the last plague, the plague when, when the, if you didn't have the blood over the doorpost, the firstborn in your home would die. So the answer is Pharaoh was, he's a deity. And so the last plague struck at the deity, the whole idea that Pharaoh was a god. And um, so all of these, they played a significant role. So having said that, look on your handout. I have Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 through 24, and then just one verse, Exodus 13. So the Bible says, Then Moses called for the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the posts with the blood, or dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out uh, the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two door side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And then in Exodus 13, 8, And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. So they were given the command to, once they were free from the Egyptian bondage, that every year they were to observe the Passover, the Passover um, ceremony. So this ceremony actually for the Jewish people is taking place uh, this Wednesday is Passover. And uh, so it, is, it has been said that it is the oldest continuous observed holiday uh, in history. And so for over 3,000 years, the Jewish people, they have worshiped uh, or observed, I should say, the Passover. And, uh, and the dinner, the Passover cedar, utilizes symbolism and prayer and recitations to recount the dramatic event that happened over 3,000 years ago. So what's happening now here in chapter 22 of the Gospel of Luke is Jesus and the disciples... Uh, they're observing the Passover. So I just want to pick it up again in verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Well, where wilt thou, where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. Now let me just stop there for a minute. Well, Jerusalem, when they entered in, it was a fairly large city for its day. And so the, the instructions are given to go in. And you're, there's going to be a man carrying a pitcher of water. That man follow him. But if you read that, you would think, well, there could be numbers of men carrying pitchers of water. How would they know which one? But that's not necessarily, necessarily the case. And why is that? What's that? Well, no, God is in charge. That's true. That, that is true. But there's, there's a, there is a, um, oh, how would you say it? There's a, uh, I don't know how you'd say it. Uh, <laughs> social significance, maybe that's the right word, with regards to this man carrying water. On Sunday? I mean, on Saturday. On no? Saturday. No? Good, Bill. Good, good guesses. Yes? It would be odd uh, for a man to do something like that. It would be odd for a man to be carrying the water. Men didn't carry the water. The, woman, the women carried the water. 
And uh, you know, you remember uh, who did who did Jesus meet uh, when he turned, uh, or not when he turned the water into wine, but his first um, when he met the woman at the well in Samaria, and that's what they did. The women carried uh, the water. So for a man to be carrying a pitcher, that would be kind of that would stand out. And so they went and he showed them the upper room. When I was in Jerusalem last year, Shelley and I, we went to a place um, that they call the upper room. The reality is that uh, like when you're in Israel, there are some places that they, they specifically know these are, this is exactly the location. And then there are other places um, where it's in a proximity and there's a room there and they call it the upper room. But it's not the upper room that Jesus and the disciples were in. But it does give you a sense when you're there to kind of be there in the, the old city and to kind of feel, you know, in that location. Um, and we had, a church, we had a service there, and, and I have a video of, of our whole group singing in that room. That was re- very nice. But um, so they, met, they meet in the room there. And there they've come to, to again, serve the Passover. And so he brings them to the, to the guest chamber. And then in verse 15, Jesus says this, And he said unto them, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So his whole life, Jesus would have observed the Passover. And the disciples would have observed the Passover. But this Passover would be a significant Passover. And uh, as we read through here, we, we find out, we find out why. Um, and, in, and in verse 16, he, he says this, but I'll not eat any more thereof until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then we come to the verse that we're looking at here. And he took the cup and he gave thanks. So I was curious about that. I, I don't know how many times I read this passage of scripture and I was reading it this week and I said, oh, wait a minute, what is this cup? What, what is this cup that they're drinking of? Okay, so now having said all that we've said so far, anybody want to take another guess? Huh? I, I can't hear you. Sorrow? No, no. When they celebrate Passover, uh, I don't really know what actually happens, but I'm sure there's a cup that they share. Yes, you're right on. That's exactly what happens here. There's actually... In the Passover cedar, and I am no expert on any of this, so I'm not going to get it all in, into it, but they, there are four cups that the Jewish people will drink out of. Actually, some have a fifth cup that they leave on the table. The fifth cup, when they, pre, when they have the, this Wednesday, when they have the Passover meal, uh, there will be a fifth cup, and the fifth cup is actually never, no one drinks out of that, because that cup is for a particular prophet that they're hoping will walk through their door. Anybody know who that is? Not Jesus. No, they, because they, they reject Jesus as the Messiah. It's for Elijah. They, they think it's Elijah that's going to come back. In fact, there's part of the cedar ceremony where they, a young child rehearses a number of things and, and reminds everyone of what happens. And then, I, I forget the exact saying, but they're, they're hoping that Elijah comes back. Now, so there's where the cup comes in, this, this cup. But there's, there's a point to the four cups. Now take your Bibles and go to the book of Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. Now, in the original Passover, I, I found this kind of interesting as well. When the original Passover took place, there were only three elements that were part of the original Passover. Anybody know what those three elements? We, we kind of read it. There's three things that were involved when the, when the Jewish people... There's been a lot of things that have been added through the centuries, is what I'm saying. But the original Passover, there's only three things. Obviously, one would be the lamb that would be slain. Right? 
And then if you look at the, if you have your handout in front of you, you're in Exodus chapter 12 there on that handout. The other was the hyssop. And, um, and then there's one other, there's one other item. I'll just tell you what it is. It was, it was the leavened bread. That was it. Over time, some things were added. And what I found kind of interesting about that is that Jesus is partaking in something that it's, um, that just became tradition. So I thought, well, not necessarily all traditions are wrong. You know, sometimes people say, well, there's certain traditions that we do, and they're not really found in the Bible. And obviously there are some things that are traditions that are offensive to the Bible. But Jesus began, he was taking part in this. They were taking part in this, this which had been added. The four cups comes from, um, according to the Jewish writings that I read, extra biblical writings, comes from Exodus chapter 6. So pick it up in Exodus chapter 6 and 1 through 8. And I want you to see how these then relate to our Passover, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Exodus chapter 6, the Bible says, Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh, and with a strong hand shall he let them go. And with a strong hand shall, hand shall he drive them out of this land. So obviously this is, being, this is being said prior to the ten plagues. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Now, beginning in verse 6. Wherefore, I say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you in unto the land concerning the which I did swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it you for an inheritance, because I am the Lord. So in verses 6 and 7, this is where the four cups come from. And uh, so if you notice on your handout, these are what Jewish people would refer to as the four expressions of deliverance. So I'll, he said, the scriptures say there, I'll bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I'll rid you out of their bondage. I'll redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I'll take you to me for a people, and I will to be to you a God. So that had been incorporated into the Passover by the time Jesus is partake, partaking of this here. But all of these four points speak of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus said, I desire to to eat this Passover with you, uh, because he knew that what was happening here is a really, quite honestly, a turning point in all of history, because uh, he's about to be crucified uh, and to be buried, and three days later, to be raised from the dead. So on your hand, you, uh, you forgive me, but the uh, first, it should say 1 Corinthians, I think it just says Corinthians uh, on yours, I, I don't, when I printed that out, I didn't, I missed that when I proofread it. But it's 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. This is just part of that verse. But it says this, For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And then this isn't, this isn't on your handout, but listen to the next verse in 1 Corinthians. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice, and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, let me just stop there for a minute. So, 
I never really thought about this until I was putting this lesson together. So somebody can, somebody can help me with this one. So part of the Passover, there was a certain ritual that the Jewish people did in their homes. They swept something out of their homes. What was They removed it from their homes. Yes, Steve. Yeah, leaven. Anything that was leaven, they removed it from their homes. They even had a little, I think if I remember correctly, sometimes a little, like a ceremonial thing where they would take a brush and they would like brush it and just to symbolically say, we've cleaned the house out of leaven. So why? What, did, what in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament as well, but what did leaven represent? It represented sin. I never thought about this until I was reading this, but who left before they had the Last Supper? Judas. He wasn't there for that. It's kind of like, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it's kind of like the leaven, the leaven was removed. And um, so um, when, when Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, Christ is our Passover, because he is the lamb and the sacrificial lamb. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven and with the leaven of malice. So, um, so we think about that. Now, on the back of your handout, we'll, finish, we'll, we'll look at these here. So these four points of, of Exodus chapter number six and these cups that Jesus and the disciples would have partaken in. So the first, again, was the idea of God was going to bring the uh, Israelites out of the burden of the Egyptians. I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Now we also know in the Bible that sometimes Egypt is symbolic of what? Anybody know? The symbolism of Egypt? Yeah, it's symbolic of the world. The sinfulness of, of the world. But the burden, and as Jesus said, I desire to eat this Passover, he's, he fulfills all four of these points. So um, the burden, you know, Jesus would say on your handout, Matthew eleven twenty 20 through 30, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So, when you and I came to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were, we were saved from the burdens, really, of this world. You know, elsewhere, the Bible says, uh, I think it's in 1 Peter chapter 5, where the Bible says, uh, Peter said, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Uh, but the greatest burden that was lifted from each of us was the sin burden. We were, we were, we were destined, uh, condemned to go to hell because we are lost. We're born into this world as lost sinners and we need to be saved. And uh, Jesus came to, to fulfill that. The Passover lamb and the rituals of the temple uh, first the tabernacle and then the temple and all of the animal sacrifices that would be instituted, they were always just pictures, foreshadows, lessons for the day that the Lamb of God would come and take away the sin of the world. And so um, Paul would write about that, the, the, that the, the shedding of the blood of the bulls and the goats could never take away our sin. It did maintain a right relationship that the Jewish people had with God. But now the true, you know, remember John the Baptist early on? John the Baptist, when Jesus was approaching, pointed, and, he, and what did he say? He said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So for previous to this uh, account, over, over a thousand years, for over a thousand years previous to when Jesus is going to go to the cross, the Jewish people had been, been taught and instructed that the Lamb of God was coming. Uh, they just rejected, by and large, that Jesus was the Lamb of God. But you and I, that's what he's done when we've accepted Christ. He's brought us out from the burden 
of this world. So the Bible says we're to be in the world, but we're not to be of the world. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. And, he, and the, second, the second cup was, I'll rid you out of their bondage. He said, and I will rid you out of their bondage, in verse 6. Uh, and so we're no longer under the bondage of sin, don't, don't need to be under the bondage of sin. Um, when Jesus died for our sins, he, he, he paid the price for our sins, but he also, the Bible says, he manifested himself uh, not only to take away our sins, but to take the power of sin that's uh, away as well. And so you and I, when we depend upon the risen Savior, when we depend upon the Holy Spirit in our lives, when we depend upon his grace and his mercy, um, we're not, only, not under the condemnation of sin, but we have within our ability and grasp to go to the Lord and ask the Lord for his help so that we're no longer under the control of sin either. Because let's face it, our enemy Satan, even though we have accepted Christ and we become a child of God, Satan will do anything that he can to try to keep us uh, from being true disciples or, or faithful disciples, I should say. So again, on your handout, Romans chapter 8, verse 15. It says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, in other words, Paul's saying that's the old life, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Then Romans 8, 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Well, let me start. What creature is he talking about? The creature itself. First he says in verse 15 that, that we've not received the spirit of, of bondage, we've received the spirit of adoption. We're free in Christ. But it, sa it says, is the day coming that the creature itself shall also be delivered. What creature? Huh? The human body? Well, that's part of it. Yeah, because we'll, we'll have new, the Bible tells us that when, when, when we see him, we'll not be, we'll be as he is. We'll have new bodies. No, although there will be some who accept him as the Messiah. Now, the creature there is the world. It's, it's the whole, the world that we live in is, is a sinful world. So one day, the, the, all of the sin of the world, when the Lord returns, and, and um, it'll be done with. We'll be living, in a sense, in a sense, the, the eternity that awaits us is like, perhaps, I guess we'll really not know till we get there, but like living in the Garden of Eden before sin. And um, there'll be no, the Bible tells us, there'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more tears, there'll be no more death, no more sickness. It's kind of a world that we probably, at this point in our lives, at the, or at this point in our Christian experience, we really don't, I don't really think we comprehend how great it's going to be. I think, I think it'll just blow our minds. Um, but I gotta, we're, we're running out of time. I've got to move quickly. And then the, the third uh, cup that they would have, would, would be where the Bible says, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm with, with great judgments. And that's exactly, of course, what Jesus did. Again, on your handout, Hebrews 9, 8. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Well, as the first tabernacle was standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. In other words, that's talking about the Jewish temple and all of the ritual and all that went with it. And you notice the writer of Hebrews says, none of these things could make us perfect. Uh, we could say, like, none of us, there's nothing that you and I can do that makes us perfect in the eyes of God, with the one exception is admitting that we're sinners and receiving Jesus Christ as our Savior, putting our full faith and trust in the finished work of Calvary, our Passover. But Christ, it says, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, 
neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. One time. That's why tonight when we observe the Lord's Supper, when we take of, when we take of the, the bread and we take of the grape juice, you know, there are those, they believe in a, in a doctrine called uh, uh, transubstantiation, where it actually literally turns into the blood and to the body of Christ. Well, no, no, the Bible says that he offered himself one time. One time on the cross. Those are just symbolic. It's our memorial service unto the Lord. And then lastly, because we are out of time, there is the blessing. The blessing where it said in verse 7, I will, take to you to, uh, I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And um, I chose Revelation 12, uh, or 5, 12 through 13, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And I thought about that as I put these verses down. And I thought of all of the blessings that God bestows upon us. I thought, as I was kind of dwelling on this, and there are so many blessings, but the greatest blessing of all, I think, for us is to be able to say that I'm a child of God, Amen. that he's my God, he's my king, my savior. And uh, that's the greatest blessing of all, just to know that I, uh, because of Jesus, I am one with Christ. My sins have been forgiven, and I've become a child of God. And uh, we, I think, because we've received Christ, we take that all for granted. And um, so many go through this world not knowing Jesus as their Savior, and uh, they miss out on the gr greatest blessing of all, just to, to have a oneness with the Lord. So... That would be the last time that that cup would be observed. And uh, then right after that, it's, it's, the, it's really a transition period that's taking place here. I have a little note in my Bible. I should have read this, and then we're going to pray and we'll be done. But um, I wrote this down just to remind myself of this. So what you really have here in, in the Gospel of Luke and the old cup and, and the new cup, if you will, it's really a transition, really, between the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. And, um, and it's interesting how this all took place there at that moment and that time. And then again in verses, uh, in verses uh, 19 and 20, Jesus really here, he institutes the Lord's Supper, the communion cup, the bread representing his body that was about to go to the cross and his blood representing, of course, the shed blood on the cross. And he says, this do in remembrance of me. We're reminded to do that and to be uh, just a time where we remember just, just what a blessing it is to know that, uh, again, our sins have been forgiven, we're saved, and we're on our way to heaven. Let's pray. Lord, bless the morning worship service. We pray that it would bring honor and glory to you. Thank you again for your love, mercy, and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so glad that you've taken the time to join us today. If you've been blessed by the message, or if you have placed your faith in Jesus today, we want to hear from you. Maybe you still have questions about what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Please let us know, and we would love to answer those questions from the Bible. We would also be happy to provide you with the Bible and other free Christian resources to help you grow in your faith. You can email us at info at mountgraylockbaptist.com or send us a message on Facebook. You can also call us at 413-662-2107. We would love to hear from you, and our desire is to be a blessing to you in any way that we can. God bless.